Right guys, welcome to Issues and Debates Lesson 5, which is Holism and Reductionism. The different sections of the video, outline, evaluation, and so on, are all listed in the description section below, and so if you want to jump to a particular section, you can do that. If you're interested in some exam practice on the topic, including some essay practice, you can follow the link at the end of the video, and I'll also pop it in the description section below. Finally, if you find this video useful, please let me know by hitting the like button. So, as with all lessons in this topic, at the core of holism and reductionism is a debate. Can we truly understand human behavior if we break it up into component parts, which is something that psychology does a lot, or do we have to look at the entire picture if we want to really understand what is happening? So let's start with holism. Holism states that behavior can only be fully understood when seen as a whole. Any attempt to subdivide behavior or experiences into smaller units is inappropriate and effectively only leads to an incomplete or incorrect picture. People can only be understood if their entire story is taken into account. Now, if you consider something like mental illness, Holism would say that you can only understand what is causing the mental illness if you're looking at all elements of why that particular illness has occurred, and you can only treat it with a bespoke treatment for that person. There are quite a lot of examples of holism in psychology, one of which is Gestalt psychology. So Gestalt psychology suggests that when we try to make sense of the world around us, we don't just focus on all the small details, but rather we experience objects in our environment as elements of a more complex system. Examples of this are quite common and you kind of see them quite a lot like the picture you can see on the screen now. So the white cube that you can see in the center isn't actually there, but our brain is perceiving all of the elements within the image and is helping us to view the image as part of something bigger rather than just all of the individual component parts. And there are tons more example like that that illustrate how the brain takes a holistic approach. Okay, so you can have a look at any of those pictures. All of those are examples of how the brain will take all of the individual components and produce something that's different. Now, another example of holism in psychology is the humanistic approach. Now, obviously, the humanistic approach is something that you have covered as part of the curriculum. If you can't remember much about the humanistic approach, then the video to that lesson will appear on your screen in a second, and you can go ahead and check that out. Humanistic psychologists believe that only by paying attention to the whole individual and their experience can behavior be fully understood. OK, it's one of the only approaches that we cover in the A-level curriculum that takes a holistic approach as opposed to a reductionist approach. OK, behavior is not something that can be reduced into individual units. Human beings can only be understood if they are viewed in their entirety. All right, so moving on to the other side of the debate, which is reductionism. Now, reductionism is the idea that all phenomena should be explained using the simplest principles possible, which is known as parsimony. According to this approach, human behavior can and should be explained by breaking it down into its component parts, and that all explanations should take part within the basic framework of science. OK, reductionist approaches, for example, would suggest that there's no need to investigate all aspects of a person to work out why they have depression. Let's say when you can focus on just one thing, which could be levels of serotonin and then treat the depression using antidepressants. OK, so that would be more of a reductionist approach. We are breaking depression down into lots and lots of components. In this case, it is the lack or the lower levels of serotonin, which is one element of depression. And we are going to focus on that and we're going to treat that rather than focusing on all the other potential things. Now, the reductionist approach can also be split into different levels known as levels of explanation. OK, so the idea is that researchers can try to explain and understand an aspect of human behavior by focusing on just one of these levels. 
it's basically a hierarchy of explanations with each layer of the hierarchy being slightly less reductionist than the one that came before it if you're working from the bottom up. Obviously, if you're working from the top down, then every level becomes slightly more reductionist. Now, the lower levels of explanation considers things like physiological explanations, where behavior is explained in terms of neurochemicals and genes and brain structure, for example. But then you have the middle level, which is all about psychological explanations, for example, those provided by the cognitive and the behaviorist approaches, where behavior is explained in terms of things like irrational thoughts, let's say, or the environment. And then you've got the highest level of explanation, which considers social and cultural explanations, where behavior is explained in terms of the influence of social groups and cultural norms. Beyond the social and cultural explanations, you've then got holism, which is technically the highest level of explanation in that it's not reductionist at all. Okay, so let's look at a couple of examples from the curriculum because you might need them in an exam. So let's take memory, for example. At the biological level, Maguire et al. in 2000 found an association between the size of the hippocampus and people's memory for spatial and navigational tasks. Okay, so that is a biological explanation for a specific type of memory. At the psychological level, however, cognitive psychologists examine particular aspects of memory, like Miller in 1956, who examined the capacity of short-term memory. Or you might have Peterson and Peterson, who looked at the duration of short-term memory. And then at the highest level of explanation, you have Bartlett, for example, from 1932, who suggests that cultural expectations affect our schema, which in turn affect what we remember and how we recall information. OK, so all of those explanations are valid. They're just taking a slightly less reductionist approach each time. Or a different example could be depression. So at the lowest level, explanations surrounding levels of serotonin or the presence of certain genes come into play. Whereas on a psychological level, depression could be explained using cognitive approaches like the presence of irrational thoughts or even behavioral elements like modeling. And at the highest level, depression could be explained through the presence of societal factors such as labeling. So in this case, the stigma of being labeled as having depression could lead to discrimination and lowered sense of self-worth, which in turn might increase symptoms of depression and create this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. OK, now, which one of these explanations is the best is completely up for debate. All of them are valid. But the point to take away here is that as you work your way down the levels, each of the explanations is more reductionist than the one that came before it. But that being said, each of the explanations still provides a valid explanation for depression. Now, before we carry on, levels of explanation came up as a 16 mark essay in the 2023 exam series. It threw people off massively with the examiner's report saying that loads of students seem completely unprepared for this type of question. Now, I think the reason it threw people off is because levels of explanation is one element of the holism and reductionism topic. And nobody expected that particular element to be picked out and an essay to be made out of just that thing. OK, now there is going to be an exam video on how to tackle that question. So keep an eye out for it. As soon as it drops, I will link it into this video as well. So you can just access it from here. Now, alongside the levels of explanation, you also need to know specific types of reductionism, such as biological and environmental determinism. Each type of reductionism is generally associated with a particular approach in psychology. For example, biological reductionism focuses on biological explanations for behavior and is based on the premise that we are all biological organisms. That being the case, all behavior is at some level biological and can be explained through genetic, evolutionary or neurochemical or even neurophysical factors. 
biological reductionism features in the biological approach and has been successfully applied to various areas in psychology. For example, the investigation of psychological disorders at a neurochemical level has led to the creation of biological treatments for many conditions such as depression, OCD and schizophrenia because those conditions have been reduced to specific biological factors which can then be targeted and treatments can be created. Environmental reductionism, however, on the other hand, refers to the attempt to explain all behaviour in terms of stimulus response links that we've learned through experience. And it is the basis of behaviourism, which is only concerned with observable behaviour. OK, so if you're ever outlining and evaluating behaviourism, you can argue that it is environmentally reductionist. OK, so you can link these points together a little bit. Now. If we take attachment, just as an example, the idea of love is reduced to a learned association between the provider of food and the pleasure of receiving that food. OK, that is environmentally reductionist. Equally, in psychopathology, the development of a phobia, let's say, is reduced to a learned association between a traumatic event and a previously neutral stimulus. OK, so for both of those topics that I've just mentioned, and if you can't remember those, they'll appear on your screen in a minute, but for both of those topics, again, you can link environmental reductionism in, and you can say that the two process model or the learning theory of attachment is environmentally reductionist. Okay, now it's important at this point, I'm giving you these examples because if you ever have to talk about what environmental reductionism is, or biological reductionism for that matter, and you decide you want to put it into an essay, it always makes sense to try and have an example from the curriculum ready to go. Okay, now you don't have to get fancy with your examples, just having one or maybe two that you can rely on and talk about. So whether that's the two process model of phobias or whether it's the cupboard love theory of attachment or whatever else, just make sure you have an example at the ready to flesh out an exam answer if you need it. So there is a little summary slide for you because there's quite a lot of information in this PowerPoint. Um, we are going to move on to the evaluation points now, but if you want to pause on that slide, then you can. Okay, so let's have a look at some evaluation points just before we finish off. Just be aware, very often evaluation points for issues and debates like this can be flipped around and used for the other side of the argument. So a strength of reductionism could very often also be made into a weakness of holism with a bit of tweaking and a little rewording. So some of the evaluation points have got natural counterpoints with them to do exactly that, but some of them don't. OK, so just keep thinking about how you could potentially use the points to evaluate the opposite. OK. So the first problem with taking a holistic approach is that it may lack practical value because holistic explanations for behavior tend to be very, very complex. So, for example, when trying to understand the development of a condition like depression, taking a holistic approach would involve taking a lot of factors into consideration, such as their past, their family circumstances, their job, their present situation, and so on. And as much as that's great, because it presents a very, very holistic picture of that person, it also makes it very, very hard to determine which of those things is most important. And the knock-on effect of that is that it makes it tricky when trying to prioritize one particular thing to target for therapy. OK, so that means that holistic explanations might not always offer the best route to providing support for individuals. Conversely to that, of course, the reductionist approach has very good practical value because of its nature of homing in on one particular aspect which can be targeted for treatment. For example, the focus on genes and neurotransmitters means that biological reductionism has led to the development of drug therapies like SSRIs and antipsychotics both of which have been shown to be highly effective in treating various conditions. Now, if I'm going to use this as an evaluation point, I can, of course, use some research here to back up my point, like Sumro et al. from the OCD topic. So it was a nice idea to do that because then you're chucking in a little bit of research. 
You don't have to use that particular piece of research, but I would recommend just having some research in there that gives your point a little bit of oomph, because otherwise it's just an opinion which won't count for much. Now, like I said before, this is the counterpoint to the point that came before it. The holistic approach does not have great practical value. However, the counterpoint to that is that the reductionist approach does have great practical value. Okay, both of the points focus on treatments. However, one's good and one is bad. Now, a strength of the reductionist approach is that they are very often in line with scientific approaches. That's because in order to conduct well-controlled scientific research, we need to operationalize the variables being studied. And operationalizing the variables means breaking them down into their component parts, which then in turn allows us to conduct experiments, record observations, and so on in an objective and a reliable way. Okay, that means that you can infer cause and effect for example. And that ultimately gives psychology greater credibility and places it on equal terms with the natural sciences, which is a good thing. However, on the other hand, reductionist approaches have also been criticized for oversimplifying complex behavior and in the process reducing the validity of their explanations. So, for example, if you only explain a behavior at the biological level, then you're ignoring the context in which it occurs, which may also be playing a very important role. For example, just because depression can be successfully treated using antidepressants doesn't mean that a chemical imbalance is the cause of the condition. So you might just end up treating the symptoms of depression rather than actually treating the cause. And that means that in order to gain a real understanding of what causes certain behaviors, it is very, very important to consider a variety of factors, which the reductionist approach doesn't do. However, the holistic approach does. OK, so as much as the reductionist approach is technically more scientific, it might also be missing important pieces to the puzzle that they're trying to solve. OK, and then finally, following on from the last point, you also have the issue that many behaviours can only be understood at the higher level of explanation. And so taking a reductionist approach would make absolutely no sense. So, for example, aspects of some social situations only emerge within a group context and can't be understood in terms of the individual group members as was the case with the Stanford Prison Study, where the interactions between individuals and the behavior of the group was particularly important, and the behavior of the individuals by themselves was less important. Okay, so taking a reductionist approach in these instances wouldn't provide a valid account of the behavior in question, and so taking a reductionist approach would be absolutely pointless. OK, so there are situations where holism is the only way to go because you're trying to understand the higher level behaviors. OK, and that is a limitation of reductionism. And that brings us to the end of our video. I know that it's been a bit of a longer one and I know that holism and reductionism is slightly complex. Um, Unfortunately, the issues and debates topics are a little bit like that. However, I do hope it's all made sense and I hope it's been useful. If you do have any questions, please pop them in the comment section below and I will do my best to get back to you ASAP. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next one.